Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. My goal is to help you teach and study the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. And I want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep. And remember that the power in Teaching with Power comes from the scriptures themselves and the Spirit as you study and prepare with real intent. And this week, we're going to be studying the three epistles of John and the book of Jude. And right out of the gate, I want you to know that we're going to spend the bulk of our time in the first epistle of John. So let's get started with a little bit of background. The three epistles of John were most likely written by John the Beloved. And in my opinion, the writing certainly fits his style. And the writer also tells us right at the beginning of his letter that he was an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. So John the Beloved does fit that description. It's unknown exactly when and where it was written. Many biblical scholars think that it was possibly written from Ephesus sometime between 70 to 100 AD. And uh, the author is writing to the members of the church in the area of modern-day Turkey. And the major purpose of the letter was to confront the false teachers in the area that were claiming that Jesus Christ was not actually mortal with a physical body. Therefore, Jesus wasn't literally resurrected from the dead. So John's going to address that problem and encourage the members to turn to the living Christ and choose him and his teachings over these worldly philosophies. It's obvious that the author is heavily influenced and inspired by the teachings of Jesus at the Last Supper, especially Christ's teachings on love. He's really taken by this idea of love. So hypothetically speaking, when Paul gets up and tells us that the greatest of all the gifts of God is charity, John's going to stand up and shout out, Amen, brother. So with you, I'd like to begin with a little activity. I'm going to display some choices up on the screen, and I want you to ask yourself, which of the two do you prefer? And if I were in a classroom setting, I am sure that this would spark a lively discussion about which side is best. But for now, I just want you to contemplate which one you would choose. So here we go. White or wheat? And that's talking about bread. Uh, when it comes to driving a car, stick or automatic? How about with your phone, iOS or Android? Chocolate or vanilla? And then finally, cats or dogs? And I know that last one might spark some real controversy in a classroom, but I think I've illustrated my point. And the point is that we all have agency and we all know how to use it. You know how to make choices. Well, the letters of John are going to present a choice to you. John is a master of contrasts. You see it in his gospel, you see it in the book of Revelation, and you certainly see it here in his letters. He's always speaking in dichotomies. John's letters may be a little difficult to follow because he's not making his point linearly, but with more of a circular reasoning pattern. He keeps coming back and back to the same ideas and points, making them over and over again in a circular manner to emphasize his message. But if you just know what the contrasts are, you're going to be able to see that message flow throughout his writing. And when you do that, you'll see just how simple John's message is, even in its apparent complexity. John is going to help you make a simple choice. He'll clearly present the two sides of them to you, and then he's going to stand in the middle and say, choose. Now, there's a powerful scriptural idea that you need to understand here before we truly dive into the book of John. And when you understand this concept, you'll see it pop up all over the scriptures. I can't take credit for this. I have to give that to my cousin, Jared Halverson, for pointing this out to me. But the idea is that we all have three sets of parents. The first two sets are fairly easy to identify. We all have a heavenly father, and we also doctrinally know that we have a heavenly mother, and they are the parents of our spirits. We also have an earthly father and an earthly mother, and they are the parents of our bodies. But now we have a choice to make. We can't do anything about those first two sets of parents. We're stuck with them. But we do get to choose our third set of parents. And there are two that we can choose from. Now, this parentage is symbolic and figurative, not literal. So what is another father that you can choose? And I'm not going to show you all of these suggested references, but maybe a few just to give you the idea. But keep in mind that there are many others in the scriptures. This is just a sampling. 
So let's start with Mosiah 5, 7. And now because of the covenant which you have made, you shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day hath he spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. And then another verse, 1 John 3, 9 through 10. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So hopefully you could see in those verses who the other father is, and that would be Christ. And in the book of John, he refers to him as God, but sometimes those titles can be interchangeable. But Christ is certainly a father. He'll, you'll see him referred to as the father in certain places, and, and this is why. But uh, who is his wife, per se? Again, remember, we're not talking about a physical relationship, but a symbolic one. Who is Christ symbolically married to? So let's take a look at a few other verses here. Ephesians 5, through 25. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And then to 2 Corinthians 11.2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And in this verse, Paul is addressing the church. So who is Jesus' bride? It's the church. The church is the mother figure in this relationship, and she has a name. Her name is Zion. And you know that sometimes Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom in the scriptures, and that's because of the second coming when he's going to be reunited with his wife, his church, his bride. And they are the parents of our covenant, as we saw back in Mosiah 5-7. So when you're baptized or born again, you are born to this new set of parents, and they provide for you spiritually and protect you and nourish you and teach you as you grow up in the gospel. Now we can choose that set of parents or we can choose a different father. And who might that be? Well, let's take a look at 1 John 3.10 and also John 8.44. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So, Satan is the other father that I can choose. But who is his symbolic wife in this case? You can probably just figure it out by looking at the contrast with the other set of parents. What can I choose beside the church as a mother? Let's take a look at 1 John 4, 5. <clears throat> they are of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. And then on to Revelation 17, 4 through 6. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So who is Satan's companion? Well, it's the world. And her name is Babylon or the mother of harlots. And when I say the world, I don't mean the earth itself, like mother earth. I mean the church of the devil, that worldly influence that is contrary to God's kingdom. In the scriptures, Satan's church is often depicted as a harlot or the mother of all abominations. And you see this a lot in the scriptures, especially in the book of Revelation, which was also written by John. And they are the parents of what? Well, take another look at this passage in 1 John chapter 3, and you'll see that they are the parents of sin. And you'll also see that Satan is referred to as the father of lies and contention as well. So we all have a choice to make in this life. Who is going to be your third set of parents? And you've got to make this choice very carefully. 
Now, I can't imagine many people consciously choosing Satan as their father. But how quickly do we choose his wife, the world, not realizing who she's married to? I think you can better tell who you've chosen by looking at the mothers. Which of those two mothers do you spend more time with? One of those moms is very strict. She has rules and consequences for breaking those rules. The other mom doesn't have any rules. She's the proverbial cool mom that lets you do whatever you want. She's cool until you realize why she lets you do whatever you want. It's because she doesn't care about you. She could care less about the trouble that those actions are going to bring into your life. The other mother may have high expectations, but why? Because she really does love you, and so does her husband. That will be one of the major themes of the epistles of John, love, and how much this symbolic set of parents really loves you. So with that in mind, let's finally dive into 1 John. And the way I'd like to approach this book is with an activity that I call a thinking map. And here's what it looks like. It has a number of boxes to fill in with the related references below it. You read the references and then fill in the box with the main idea that you found. And remember that John is presenting us with a choice, so you're going to be looking for contrasts. If there are no references below the box, then I invite you to figure out what is implied by contrast with its corresponding message on the other side. John wants to help you see why you should choose Christ and his church as your parents. So I've put this sheet together with those contrasts clearly pointed out, and I invite you to go into these verses and see if you can find them. Ideally, if you can or would like to, you could print out the thinking map, and I'll make it available at my Etsy shop for a very, very small purchase if you'd like it, and try to fill it out before you watch the rest of the video. Then I'll guide you through and you can see how you did. So here we go. First, we're going to start with the set of parents. John does point these out. So let's go to 310. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And then chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So there you have your two sets of parents, God and the church, or the devil and the world. But what distinguishes those two sets of parents? What qualities will those two sets of parents emanate or embody? So let's start with God and his church. Chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And then 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So the two things that they are full of, light and love. But what about the devil and the world? Let's take a look at these verses. 2, 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. Then 2.11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. And chapter 3, verse 13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. So what are the two qualities that you see coming from the devil and the world? Darkness and hate. A perfect contrast to the other set of parents. Now the next question, how do I show my love or my willingness to choose the set of parents that I've chosen? And I see three things that show us who we've chosen and how we show our love. So let's start with Christ and his church. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word... In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Chapter 2, 29. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Chapter 3, verse 9 with the JST. Whosoever is born of God doth not continueth in sin. For the Spirit of God remaineth in him and he cannot continue in sin, because he is born of God, having received that Holy Spirit of promise. And then chapter 5, verses 2 through 3, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 
So what's the first way that I show my love for God? It's obedience. I keep his commandments. And I love that final phrase in verse 3. His commandments are not grievous. Our Heavenly Father doesn't really ask us to do anything that's grievous or unreasonable. And maybe that's a good question to think about. How do you feel about God's commandments? Are they grievous to you? Or do you see them as guidance from a loving Heavenly Father? In fact, if there was one word that I would change in the gospel, it would be the word commandment. Because when you look at that word, what stands out to you? The word command. Like, you have to do this because I say so. But that is not really the spirit of the commandments. I would call them divine guidancements or heavenly helpments. Because really, the commandments are there to protect us and bless us and keep us on the right path and keep us happy. So it's a good question to consider. How do you feel about God's commandments? Well, you could probably figure out what's going to be on the other side. How do I show if I've chosen the devil as my father? Chapter 2, verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 2.16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Chapter 3, verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And then 3.10, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. I know we've read that one a couple times. But how do I show that I've chosen Satan? Well, I don't keep his commandments. I'm disobedient. I sin. Let's take a look at the second quality. Chapter 2, verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. Chapter 4, 7 through 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Chapter 4, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And then 4, 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. So the second way I show that I've chosen God, I love my fellow man. What about the other side? Chapter 2, verse 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. 2.11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. 3.13. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. And 4.20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he hath not seen? So how do I feel about my fellow man? I hate my fellow man. To continue with that idea, how do I show my love for my fellow man? John's going to teach us that as well. Two ways. Chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So the first way I show my love for my fellow man is the way that Jesus showed his love for us, sacrifice. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean giving our life physically, but sacrificing our needs, our desires, our time, our efforts for other people. And then the other way is 3, 17 through 18. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So the other way I show my love for my fellow man, I serve him. I, I have compassion on him. I love my brother, not just in word, but in deed and in truth. But what about the other side? Chapter 3, verse 12 and 15. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So John is using Cain as an example. And so if I show my love for my fellow man by giving my life for him, 
then I show my hatred for my fellow man in the opposite way, by taking his life. And again, that may be not be literal, but I take things from others, whether it's their life or their goods or their spirit or their joy. So I show my hate for my fellow man by slaying and stealing. And then what's the other way? Chapter 3, verse 17. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? So the second way, the opposite of serving, I shut up the bowels of my compassion. And since I like the alliteration in this, I'm going to say you snub your brother. You don't help. You ignore him and his needs. And now what's the third way we show our love for God? Chapter 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Chapter 4, verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Chapter 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And chapter 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So the third way is we believe in Christ. Now to the other side, chapter 2, verses 22 through 23. Who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And chapter 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. So rather than believing in Christ, I confess not Christ, or I deny Christ. So those are the three actions that are going to really help us to know which set of parents we've decided to follow. But one final question. I think John really wants us to understand the consequences of our choice. He wants us to know the results that will come depending on which side we choose. And I see at least nine. So here we go. Chapter 1, verse 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So one of the results of choosing Christ? Joy. Which, by implication, if you choose the devil, what will it bring you? Misery. The second one. Chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Chapter 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chapter 2, 1 through 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In chapter 2, verse 12, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. One of the greatest blessings that we receive for choosing Christ is that his blood will cleanse us from our sins. Yes, sin is one of those indications that tells us we're on the other side. But our Heavenly Father understands that we're not going to live a perfect life, that we are going to make mistakes. And so that's why he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to cleanse us and forgive us. We don't have to be discouraged and worried when we fall short. Jesus Christ, our advocate, our lawyer, is going to be right there with us at the judgment to stand up for us, to say, yes, I know that they're guilty. I know that they've made a mistake, but they chose me. They had a desire to follow me. So forgive them of their sin and let me take the judgment on my shoulders. I'll be the propitiation for their sins. So we have an amazing father who was willing to stand up for his children and defend them when they make mistakes. But if I've chosen the devil, the devil has no desire to do anything for us. He seeks us to be miserable like unto himself. And so our sins will remain. Our sins are not forgiven. The next result, chapter 2, verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So, you get light and no stumbling. You'll know where you're going. You're not going to be lost in this life. 
you're going to have a clear idea of the path that you need to take. On the other hand, chapter 2, verse 11, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I'm going to be lost. I'm going to be blind. I'm going to be stumbling around in the dark if I choose the other side. Maybe you know of some people who fit that description, who have decided to choose the world as their mother. The next one, chapter 2, verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 2.25. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. And chapter 5, 11 through 13, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So one of the greatest gifts of God, eternal life. On the other hand, Chapter 2, verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. And chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And chapter 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. The polar opposite of eternal life, death, spiritual death. And they abide in that death forever, or a separation from their Father in heaven. Next, chapter 2, verse 20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. 2.27, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So those two verses may not be super clear, but I think there's a hint in the words unction and anointing, and also in what that anointing does for us. It helps us to know things and teaches us what we need to do. But if that's not clear, you're definitely going to see it in chapter 3, verse 9, with the JST. Whosoever is born of God doth not continue in sin, for the Spirit of God remaineth in him. And he cannot continue in sin because he is born of God, having received that Holy Spirit of promise. So what's one of the results of choosing Christ in his church? You have the Spirit. And by contrast, if you've chosen the world, you won't have the Spirit. You won't have that guidance. You won't know things. You won't be taught. And it will be very easy to continue in sin. Next, chapter 2, verse 28 and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In chapter 4, verses 17 through 18, this has both sides presented to us. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So we've got the two sides of the different ways that we're going to feel at the judgment. If I've chosen Christ in his church, I'm going to have confidence and boldness and look forward to the judgment. But if I've chosen the world, what am I going to feel at the judgment? Fear. Fear is the exact opposite of faith and confidence and boldness. Loving God and loving my fellow man is going to fill me with confidence Hatred and fear go hand in hand. Next, chapter 3, verse 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So another blessing he hears and answers our prayers. And on the other side, God's going to be slow to hear. Next, chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 4.13. 
Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. 4.16 And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So if we choose Christ and his church, we are going to dwell in them. We become one with God and Christ, and they in us. We have this incredible unifying bond with our symbolic parents, Christ and his church. On the other hand, I'll be separate from God and Christ, which really is the definition of spiritual death. And one more, chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So if I choose Christ and his church, I'm choosing the winning side. I will overcome the world. Therefore, on the other side, what will happen to me? I will be overcome. So right there, we have a great reason to choose the right side. If you were playing some sport and you were given the opportunity to choose a team to play on, but you already knew who was going to be the winning team, which team would you choose? I think the answer is obvious. And that really brings us to the crux of the whole point of the book of 1 John. And I know that was a lot, but hopefully you've grasped the complex yet simple message of John. And that is, choose. He has beautifully and clearly set before us the choice that we have to make. And he wants us to be as informed as possible. The world is always trying to obscure this clarity and make it seem difficult, uh, gray. But really, it's black and white. So which do you want? Do you want light and love or darkness and hate? Do you want to spend your life sacrificing and serving or stealing and snubbing? Do you want joy or misery, confidence or fear, eternal life or eternal death? Do you want to be the children of Christ and his church? Or do you want to be the children of the devil and the world? Do you want to overcome or do you want to be overcome? You have your agency. Now make your choice. But as you make that choice, John wants to make one thing clear. Look at the following references and see if you can figure out what it is. 1.6 If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And then 2.4 He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And then I'm going to add this teaching from the Savior that says it most clearly. And that is, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So what's the message there? You can't choose both. The world may try to convince you that it's possible, but in the end, it's not a viable option. Walking that tightrope can only work for so long. Eventually, you're going to fall to one side or the other. If you're going to be in, be all in. Don't live one way on Sunday and then completely another the rest of the week or when nobody is watching. I love this quote from Elder George Q. Cannon from over a century ago. He saw a problem then that is still relevant to today. We see men following the ways of the world just as much as though they made no pretensions to being Latter-day Saints. Hundreds of people who are called Latter-day Saints you could not distinguish from the world. They have the same desires, the same feelings, the same aspirations, the same passions as the rest of the world. Is this how God wants us to be? No. He wants us to have new hearts, new desires. He wants us to be a changed people when we embrace his gospel and to be animated by entirely new motives and have a faith that will lay hold of the promises of God. So I have a question for you that I would like you to ponder. Which side do you feel that you've chosen? And... How do you feel about your choice? If you've chosen Christ and the church, stick with that choice. If you've chosen the world and her companion, I invite you to join the family. I assure you that you are always welcome in the family of Christ. And if you're still waffling between the two and not quite sure, then you need to make your choice. This choice reminds me of one of my favorite movies when I was a boy, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And do you remember that last scene where Indiana has to make a choice as to which cup is the real Holy Grail? 
Choosing the wrong one brings death, and choosing the right one brings life. I hope that when we stand before Christ at the final judgment, and it's apparent what choice you've made, then just like the old knight in the movie, Christ will be able to say to you, he chose wisely. And hopefully he'll not have to sadly look on and declare, he chose poorly. So choose wisely. That's my hope for each of you. Now, the other two epistles of John are very short, and I'm not going to do much with them. You'll see that same clear message of choice in these two short letters. Both letters clearly show that the descent into apostasy is becoming more and more of a threat to the early church. Second John is addressed to the elect lady, which is more than likely a reference to the church. Remember, the church is Christ's bride. John's message to her is to stay in the truth and to watch out for deceivers. There's another contrast that shows up very prominently in both 2nd and 3rd John, and that is between truth and deception, or lies. Christ and his church are full of truth, as well as light and love. And Satan and the world are full of lies. The word truth is mentioned four times in 2nd John and seven times in 3rd John. 3rd John is also a contrast. Two different leaders in the church that exemplify the two sides. Gaius on the side of truth, and Diotrephes on the side of deception. I'll let you study these two short books with the same approach we took in 1 John and identify the two sides. But if there was only one verse that I would draw your attention to in these two books, it would be 3 John verse 4. I really do love this one. He says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And I know that this is a message from John speaking to the members, but surely Christ as our Father feels the same way. When I was younger, and if I ever asked my parents what they wanted for their birthdays or Christmas, I always got the same answer. Good kids. I'm sure this is what Christ would want more than anything else. It's really one of the only things that we can give him. I know that as a parent, I feel this way. Nothing makes me happier than to hear that my children are walking in truth. And now the book of Jude. Again, I won't do much with this book either. It's obvious that the writer of Jude was heavily influenced by the book of 2 Peter, or vice versa, and contains a very similar message. Either way, Jude, like James, was one of Jesus' brothers. The date of its writing is hard to determine, but probably close to the same time as the epistle of 2 Peter. The context, again, is false teachers creeping into the church. In this case, the false teachers are saying that because of Christ's grace, they were basically free to do whatever they wanted. Jude shoots this down fairly vehemently. And what I like most about the book of Jude are all the creative names that he gives these false teachers. Here's a quick list. Ungodly men, filthy dreamers, brute beasts, spots in your feasts of charity, clouds without water, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, ungodly sinners, Murmurers, complainers, mockers. Some really fun ones in there. He really goes after them, doesn't he? And Jude also uses three Old Testament examples to compare these false teachers to. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. What do each of those three stories have in common? Each was an example of a person that could not submit to godly authority. They each wanted power and gain. So just like with the book of Second Peter, I encourage you to avoid the false teachers and prophets of the world. And just like then, there are forces without and within the church that seek to pull people away. Watch out for the murmurers and complainers, those that try to tell you that certain sins really aren't that bad, and those that try to encourage you to rebel against priesthood authority. Instead, do what Jude suggests in verse 3. Earnestly contend for the faith. Well, that's all I have for you, my friends. If you would like a printable lesson plan with the ideas presented here, it's available at this website. And if you're interested in using the PowerPoint slides that were used to make this video, they're available for a small purchase here. Both links are available in the video description below. I hope the video helped you out. If it did, please share it with others. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.